Okay, so welcome to the 10th video in the discrete structures series and we'll start this video off with a quick discussion on summations and then we'll have a look at the summation of some common types of series, the arithmetic and geometric series that we looked into our last video. We looked at their general terms but we'll continue this video with a look into the sum of n terms. And then we'll look at some common series formula and try to make sense of them. And this will involve the sum of natural numbers, the sum of squares, the sum of cubes, and all those basic types of series. Following that up, we'll look at double summations. And we'll solve a couple of problems in this category with the exam perspective. Okay, so diving on to the first topic, what is a summation? It is just a process of adding items of a sequence. So when I say 1, 3, 5, 7, and let me end here, let it be a finite sequence. So when I'm listing these numbers like so, I call these sequences. But when I add all of these numbers together, it becomes a summation or a series. So a series is nothing but a sequence with all of its terms added together. And then in order to show a series for this sequence, I could use this notation. I could say 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 and this would indeed represent the sum that I'm going for but it is beneficial to formalize this concept with the summation notation so this notation is just used to denote sums of items in a series and what you write here is any general term and you could provide a range from let's say a to b for which this summation must act so what does that mean so let's say I want to represent this series an easy one first 1 2 3 the set of natural numbers so if I want to look at the nth element in this series, it's just going to be n. So all I'm doing in this series is I'm adding all those n's from let's say n equals 1 to k, right? How many elements do I need in my sum besides the value of k? And when I expand this sum, I start with a 1 and then a 2 and then a 3 and then I go all the way up to k. If I want to really represent the infinite sum, I could just say infinity, right? And this would be really powerful and it could represent the infinite series. Could you find a representation for this one? So this is the series 2n minus 1 if you'd remember. You could use the arithmetic progression formula to figure this out, but you could observe that each term is just 2n minus 1, right? So I'll just be adding 2n minus 1 for n equals 1 through 4 for this example. So to generalize this, the summation notation allows me to add the items in a sequence for a range of values, let's say from m to n in this case okay so i would be taking terms from a series starting from index m up to the index n so that was the basic about series and summations now let's have a look at summations for the common types of series that we discussed in our last video so let's say sum of arithmetic series and then in this section i'll discuss the sum of geometric series and these are really interesting analytical solutions. Consider any arithmetic series. So the first term is a, and then let's say I have a difference of d. And then for a geometric series, I would start again with a, but take a ratio of r, as you would know. So this one first, a is going to be my first element, and the second element is going to be a plus d. The third element is going to be a plus 2d, and we have established this in our last video. And let me index these. This is my first element, the second element, the third element, and then when I go to my nth element, I reach a plus n minus 1 times d, right? So this is my nth item. Now if I need to add all of these together, and let me put brackets in here so that we know what the groups are, and then I'm adding all of these things together. So what would the result be? How many a's do I have? I have one a here, one here, one here, and in total I'll have n a's. Do you agree? So 1a in each term and there are n total terms. So that would leave me with n a. And let us count the d's. Okay, so I have d's, but how many do I really have? So I have 1d here. So let me tell 1. I have 2 here. So that's plus 2. And then I go on, don't I? Up till n minus 1. And I know that the result of adding numbers from 1 to n is n times n plus 1 by 2. And therefore, if I add from 1 to n minus 1, the equivalent expression is just going to be n times n minus 1 divided by 2, right? Because this n gets replaced with an n minus 1. 
and this n plus 1 becomes a n. And therefore, my formula would be n a plus d times this factor, n n minus 1 by 2. Okay, and I can simplify this to n by 2, 2 a plus n minus 1 times d. So this would be the sum for an arithmetic series. And before we move into geometric, there's one more way to represent this. We know that the general term is a plus n minus 1 times d. So I can find the factor a plus n minus 1 into d here, right? If I leave 1a alone, break this into 2. So therefore, this would essentially be n by 2 a plus tn, all right? So two ways to add an arithmetic series. You could just use this formula n by 2 2 a plus n minus 1 into d or you could take n by 2 the first term plus the last term that you are going to add up to so looking into the sum of a geometric series next so for any geometric series so let's say sum of geometric series so let me start this one by writing the general terms too so let's say the sum of a geometric series is the sum of its terms a a r a r squared and then it goes on up to the nth term, which is a r to the power n minus 1. And this time, let me do this. Let me multiply this sum with the ratio r. And doing this will allow me to cancel out a lot of factors. So when I do this, the first term a becomes a r. And I don't want to write it here. I want to shift it one space to the right so that I can later cancel this with this. The next term generated would be r times a r, right? So a r squared, so that that would go here. And it would continue the pattern. It would also generate this term, a r to the power n minus 1, right? From the previous term, from the n minus 2 term. And this term itself will produce one more term to the right, right? Everything's being shifted. So this is going to give me a r to the power n when I multiply this with a r one more time. So all I need to do now is to subtract these equations. And that will lead me to this expression equals, you can see the a remains. Everything in the middle gets cancelled out except this thing, right? So a minus a r to the power n. And I could say s n times 1 minus r. And let me take a, the common. That would give me 1 minus r to the power n. And therefore, my sum would be a times 1 minus r to the power n by 1 minus r. And before we look at some, some useful series, I just want to touch a little bit more on geometric series on the topic of convergence. So imagine this series, 1, 2, 4, 8, and so on, okay? So it's a geometric series. Imagine all of these terms are being added. And when I add this, you could easily see that each new term is bigger and bigger than the previous term, and the sum explodes to infinity. The sum diverges, so to speak, okay? But if you look at this series, or in fact any series whose ratio is less than 1, so let me take a series with a ratio of a half because that's easy to visualize too. So I want to call this series 1 by 2 plus 1 by 4 and then it goes on, okay, starting with 1 by 2 and on each term it gets halved. If I take infinite terms in this series, what happens? Although I'm continuing the process of adding positive numbers together, it still cannot explode it has to converge to one specific value. And the reason can be kind of visualized in a graph. So let's say, so let's say this whole square represents one unit of area. And let me represent this series as total area inside this square, okay? So I start with a half, so that's half the square, and that gives me this area, okay? And then I add a fourth, so that is half of a half, right? So if I divide this half further into a half, that's a fourth, so that would be this area. So every time I get a new term in the series, all I need to do is to divide the remaining area into a half. So one eighth would be represented like this or this. So let me have this. Okay, this is one eighth included. And then the next term would do this, this included, the next term would do this, this included. And you see what I'm getting at. There's no way that this series could ever leave the boundaries of this square right? Because each time I repeat this process, even if I do it infinitely many times, all I'm doing is getting closer and closer to the total area, which is a 1. So it is kind of possible to see practically that this series would converge to a 1. Okay? But could we also have a look at that analytically? So let me look at this formula here, and we want to look at what happens when r is less than 1, the ratio, okay? And I want to use infinity for n, right? Because I'll be adding infinite terms for the series to converge. It's not like I can add two terms and get a one, right? I have to add infinitely many terms in order to get a one. So this expression would really be, you know, Sn equals a times one minus, what would happen here? So this is a fraction, 
let's say one by something less than one right and we are raising it to a very high power okay so this will go to zero any number greater than one would explode when doing this thing but any number less than one would just go to zero because each new power would just be smaller and smaller okay so this entire expression the r power n factor goes away and that just leaves me with a by one minus r so let me write it here sn equals a by one minus r when r is between zero and one okay r greater than or equal to zero less than one and r is equal to one also doesn't converge as you can see from this expression so let's have a look at some useful series formula let's begin with sum of natural numbers so the summation of natural numbers we express it this way k is equals to one to n and k right so first n natural numbers so this is just going to be n times n plus one divided by two okay we only want to remember these formulas and and this comes from the arithmetic series sum formula from earlier and it's really easy to prove with mathematical induction okay so we'll look at another one so k equals one to n the sum of squares this is whenever you are facing things like one squared plus two squared plus three squared and you need to add so this formula will be used and of course this also has a proof with mathematical induction and there's a really good geometric proof for this you know it involves 3d squares so i cannot make a demonstration here but you could find this stuff online there's a visual geometric proof to this series and there's the sum of cubes which is the sum of k cube and i remember this as a square of this value okay so you just need to square the sum of one to n and then you get this formula so that would be n square times n plus one whole square divided by four again so analytical proofs for all of these are also available it's kind of like out of scope for our video so they make use of binomial theorems in order to do the analytical proof we're not going to have a look at that in this video but you should know these formulas at least these three basic ones because these turn out in a lot of places okay so let's move on to the next topic we look into the idea of double summations so what are double summations and what did summation actually do see summation helped me add items in a sequence so i could say it helped me sum the items in an array sort of right so one two three four five these elements are in an array and in order to add these items i used the summation notation what do i do if i need to add items in a matrix so let's say i have a matrix with four items and i want to add all of these it's not a big deal to add but i want to find the notation of representing sums like this in a matrix and I want a notation that's powerful enough to denote all kinds of sums. I want to be able to say something like, add me these three things together, not this one. So add me all the diagonal elements, add me all the even elements in the rows while leaving the odd elements from the columns. You know, there are infinite possibilities, right? So I want to be able to design a notation that allows me to do that. And it's the double summation notation. So whenever I use two summation signs, and write any expression that involves two variables. So let's say this summation ranges i from, let's say, any value to any value, a1 to b1, and this one, j from a2 to b2. All I would need to do is to resolve this inner summation for an i, and then the outer summation for a j, okay? So it's just like the composition of functions, the composition of summations. So whatever this expression turns out to be, I wanna sum that one more time. And being able to write this in this notation allows me to write a lot of permutations. So I have flexibility in this expression, I have flexibility in the order of summations, and I also have flexibility in the range of the summations. So that allows me to describe a whole range of summations that all come from different kinds of matrices. So you could think of a matrix cube maybe, right? So there could be a three-dimensional matrix, why not? And you could think of a triple summation that does this, right? So we do triple integrals all the time in physics whenever we're discussing volumes. We do double integrals all the time whenever we're discussing areas. And you, you kind of know that summation is also analogous to integration in, in some way, right, at least. Because in the discrete world, summation does the job of integration. It's a role player, so to speak. So let's look at a couple of problems regarding double summations. Let's say I'm required to add this. The sum from i equals one, two, three, and j equals one, two, two. And my expression is i, j okay so i want to resolve the inner summation first so in order to do that all i need to do is to take j is equals to one and two and add these two terms right so the inner so the outer summation doesn't change it's going to be i equals one two three but the inner summation let me expand on this see i doesn't really care right i just a multiplier so it's just going to be i plus two i okay and this is just going to be summation of i equals one two three and this is just going to be three i and then 
you could add, right? So it's gonna be three for i is equals to one, and it's gonna be six for i is equals to two, and then nine for i is equals to three, and then you get a uh, eighteen. And maybe I could do this a little bit more neatly, right? Maybe I could say something like this is equal to this summation one two three, just a notation, right? So I could say i doesn't really matter in the inner summation, so it's just a summation of j is equals to one two two and j. And then I could be fancy and use my formula that I learned earlier, right? So this is my i is equals to one, two, three, and I would just say i times, and all I'm doing is adding a formula, right? So j is equals to one to two is two into two plus one divided by two, right? And and in this case it didn't even help because there were so few terms. But you get the idea. I could do three i, and then again three would not matter in this summation, and then this would just be three times. The sum from one to three and then that would be three into four by two right the only thing i did different was i didn't explicitly add but used the formula for these summations and it might be worth learning these approaches because sometimes in your exam what if they say 20 right it won't be practical for you to expand 20 terms so i'll leave one more question for you guys and i won't solve it because i think i'm running out of time for this video but it's quite simple to do as well you just want to take this summation and solve it if you can okay so there's i minus j Nothing fancy, you could just solve this summation and then solve this one. For your exams, I think you can expect to get small numbers for small summations so that you don't have to remember all those kind of formulas. But don't quote me on that one. It's always worth knowing if big numbers are provided, you want to be able to expand them using the correct formulas and patterns. Okay, so that concludes this video. And in fact, that concludes the first chapter. We'll start in the next video with a fresh chapter, integers and matrices. Until then, you guys have a good day. I'll see you again. Bye.